everyone loves the language of working together and holding hands and kumbaya and whatever else. Whereas the practicalities of partisan politics make it much more difficult. Are you asking it to me? Um, I, yeah, you so, wanted to be asked the first question. I've asked you the first question. Yeah. What more can I do? Uh, no, um, so, <laughs> I, I think that's right. Uh, I think this week has been quite a good example of that because uh, there's been two moments I've had in the House of Commons this week. The first was uh, against the protocol bill that was brought in on Monday. Uh, I spoke very vigorously against it in the House of Commons. That generated a lot of uh, attention. I did a full media round on the back of that, which was quite widely covered. Uh, but yet, yesterday in the House of Commons, we had the committee bill for another contentious piece of legislation. It was on the floor of the House of Commons. Uh, it's a Northern Ireland legacy bill. Uh, and through weeks of uh, hard work and building consensus against one particular aspect of it, one of the amendments I put forward on behalf of the Labour Party won and was accepted wholesale by the government. It's unheard of for this to happen. It happened because lots of Tories, lots of people from other parties, we all work really carefully together. Nothing covering it at all. No media interest, no support for it out there, uh, very little coverage. So the more consensus there is, the less coverage it seems to generate. So you say people want consensus, they do. I think people want actually uh, at times people just to get on with things and deliver, deliver outcomes uh, when it comes to their politics. But actually it's the heat that does generate the most uh, attention, and that comes very often from people who actually say that they'd like consensus as well. But if you go back to your CLP and you say to them, well, I've been working very closely with a lot of Tories to try to do X, Y, or Z, does that, is that popular? Uh, it is, actually, because, and I do yeah. do it often. Uh, you know, I, I celebrate that uh, way of uh, working. I, I, I'm sitting here because I defeated a Tory in 2015 in an election where Labour did very poorly back down in Hove. Uh, and if you think about the electoral makeup of Hove now, uh, I, the, I overturned a majority of just, uh, just under 2,000. Now it's a, it's a very substantial majority, which means when you look at the arithmetic, that the majority of people who have lived and voted in Hove over a period of elections are now voting for a different party than they were previously. I think for the electorate, that must be, it must be incredibly exhilarating, you know, to be unencumbered by loyalty. For me, it's fantastic, because it means I have to constantly renew the relationship that I have with, the, with people there. But it is a fact that I could only be sitting here if people were voting Labour who had voted for other parties before. So I've brought that not just into my party locally, we accept it as fact, because the reason they have an MP and not a candidate is because so many people who voted Tory. So there's a simple fact. Uh, for me, in politics, talking to Tories, it doesn't make you a Tory, it helps you beat them. And that's something that I want to uh, bring into politics because I still want a Labour government. But there is a way of delivering it that I think actually uh, does inspire a, a, a consensus. Uh, it brings people with you on that journey. Uh, and it certainly heals rather than uses division as a tool for politics, which I feel very strongly about. And Polly, I'd love you to talk about you know, the 2010 election it's a hung parliament, the Liberal Democrats go into a coalition with the Conservatives. What were the calculations in the midst of all of that? Lots. Um, I think at the core of it, though, was the question of what's the best thing to do for the country. And as you know, in 2015, the Liberal Democrats played... I was going to come to you know, 2015. An, an almost existential price for having made that choice, having been involved in lots of those conversations. You know, the motivation was to do the right thing for the country. And it's interesting listening to the politicians we've just heard from the US, listening to Peter, and it's really clear, you hear the word brave talked about when politicians do reach across the aisle. And it kind of is brave because the incentives... Well, that's a yes minister word, isn't it? Where brave exactly. is used brave means, means foolhardy, stupid. Right. stupid. Exactly. It's going to get you in trouble. It's going to lose you 80% of your seats. It's going to uh, potentially get you deselected. It depends. Peter's clearly got a sensible CLP. <laughs> not every... Uh, uh, you know, not every CLP is like that. Not every Conservative Party, local party, is like that. And for me, that, that's a fundamental problem. Because we cannot just ask our political leaders to be brave. It'd be nice if they were, 
But if, if all of the incentives actually push them in an alternative direction towards partisanship, because you've got all of this internal party democracy and you have massively prioritized the power and influence of your weirdos, also known as political activists, it, it, the structure of your democracy is flawed. And, and for me, actually, the reform we need is not just departisan uh, our, our kind of central politics, but a fundamental transformation of the way we make policy in this country. In that we have had this amazing conversation today, which I think is based, on, really inspiring in lots of ways, but based on quite a flawed premise, that there is a technical solution to the problems that we face. And, and when we have heard mention of the humans who have votes and choices and agency and power, and for whom this is all supposed to be in their service, we occasionally hear them talked about as if they're sheep. And that assumption that what you need is a bunch of clever people to get together in the Tony Blair Institute or the think tank I used to run, Demos, and just sort of figure it out get a political party to adopt it maybe and then just legislate for it, is profoundly, profoundly harmful to democracy. Actually what you need is to involve people in the process of decision making because people feel utterly different about decisions in which they have been involved than decisions which are imposed upon them. Polly, I want to ask you just kind of, so after the election in 2015. I drank a lot. I'm sure you, maybe just before you drank that last glass of wine or whatever it was, maybe something stronger, did you think we did the right thing by the country or holy shit, what have we just done? We've been eviscerated. Well, both of those things. And I remember um, Paddy Ashdown gave a, a heartbreaking speech in, uh, in the Lib Dem headquarters. And he stood up and he said that Nick Clegg had done the right thing for the country and why in God's name would any politician ever do it again? And, and it, you know, it, it, it made me feel sick. And, but it's so easy to tell yourself that story. We did the right thing and the people weren't grateful. And, it, you know, people do, they, they, they say we need less democracy. There's a book uh, called 10% Less Democracy. And you get it a lot from the kind of the Silicon Valley tech bros and this sort of sense that actually what we need is less of this stuff. Because you know what, with the people, they're a bit stupid, they're a bit sheep-like, they're not very good with change. They have this really annoying tendency to be old and populist but and, and, and not to listen, not to know the answers. I was speaking to um, Tony Blair, very, I don't think I'm breaking a confidence. He said, since he left office, he's spent his time learning. And this is a Fantastically clever guy, right? Most people will agree with that. He has to learn so much about how fast the world is changing. Most people don't have the time to do that. So do you just say no democracy? In my view, that's a bad solution. But other countries are trying it, and they are going faster than us. But Polly, why do you think it was that it was the Liberal Democrats who were punished for it and not the Conservatives? <sighs> uh, because the smaller party doesn't doesn't control the story. And because, you know, the, the Conservatives had uh, put, <laughs> paid for leaflets to go through everybody's door saying that Nick Clegg had betrayed the country by supporting the Conservative government in the AV referendum, you know, but like, that's politics. You know, for me, it's, it, the partisan nature of our politics is, <coughs> is a, it's a design flaw in the way we operate. And it's because we are trying to do government for the people not by the people. We are trying to take decisions away from people. We've, we've come up with this actually quite profound lie that if you just give us your vote, we'll fix everything for you. A and it's not true. Uh, my view is that actually participative democracy, which requires more of people, it requires them to show up, to deliberate, to consider, to debate, to make decisions, to get them wrong yeah. and therefore learn, and without that, when you tell people that for one vote they can get everything they want, they end up angry, and that is the root of populism. Ruth, I mean, are you a tribal conservative? Well, I don't think I've ever brought a knife to a gunfight. I mean, I don't think anyone's ever said that um, I'm not tough in terms of, you know, you know in, in Scotland it's quite a tough place to do politics and you get a lot of scars on your back quite quickly. 
Um, but I don't think, and I wouldn't consider myself to be a tribal Conservative, and I'm pretty sure the current incumbents of number 10 wouldn't think that I'm my party or the highway sort of a person at the moment because they keep <laughs> doing things that I disagree with. But the three things that I've done in politics that I'm most proud of have all been cross-party ventures. So being part of the Better Together campaign at the independence referendum for Scotland is without a doubt the most important professional thing that I will ever do in my life. Uh, and I enjoyed working um, with people from other parties. I enjoyed working under Alistair Darling, who I would walk across coals for, because he is one of the most noble people I've ever met in politics. Uh, and he worked so hard to take so much of the strain off of those of us who were in frontline political jobs at the time, trying to do our frontline job and do the campaign job, um, and, and was an amazing person to work with and for. Um, part of the, the Remain team for the Brexit referendum at the tail end, because we had elections in Scotland, I came in at the tail end to do uh, some of the debates with Sadiq Khan uh, and others. And again, I found him to be hugely impressive. Um, if you look back at the debate at Wembley Arena, so hot, all those TV lights, 6,000 people in the Wembley Arena, millions watching on telly. About six or seven minutes before the end of the debate, you'll see somebody come on with a glass of water for Sadiq, um, because it was uh, just at the end of Ramadan, and he hadn't eaten or drunk all day, and was still recalling all of these facts, and being on, on his toes, and was deeply impressive. Uh, and the third thing that I did that I'm most proud of is the equal marriage debate in Scotland. Um, I wasn't long a politician, I wasn't long in post, I'd never really talked about my own sexuality. And one of the things that I made sure that I did, because it was really clear from the outset that there was uh, a majority for this in the country, there was also a, a very large majority for it in the, in the parliament, uh, but my own party was split, was to make sure that those people, that sort of quarter of the voting public, didn't feel like this was a stitch up by the politicians, that they didn't have their voice heard. So made sure in every debate at every stage that we put up members of both sides, even though I was deeply invested in it, and it, it was one of the things I was most passionate about and was so deeply personal to me. I made sure that people that held very different views from me were put up officially by the party to say what they believed too. Um, uh, even though you know I would spend my dying breath arguing with it because there is something about consensus which is not the same uh, as compromise and knocking the edges off of everything and just making things bland. It is about having the clash and it is about having the argument and it is about persuading people and taking them with you. And I think equal marriage both north and south of the border is a great example of that because it started off as a very progressive idea um, but was able to bring lots of people in the country that wouldn't consider themselves progressives with it because of the way that, that David Cameron, when he was in the leadership election, spoke to the Conservative faithful and said, look, we believe that marriage is good, and therefore why wouldn't we want people across the country to have good things because they're a good way for the country to have stable relationships and bring up children and all of these things. And he was able to explain it. And your original question to, uh, to Peter about going back to your CLP or going back to your local association, it's about how you sell these things too, because not every idea is of the left or of the right. A lot of them are just about how do you explain to people in ways that, that touches their value system that this is in tune with it. And that's how you can build consensus, I think. Yes, uh, it's so interesting because our politics, though, is adversarial. You just look at the design oh. of the House of Commons. You know, you've got two steeply raked... Yeah, but, but don't think because Holyrood is in a semicircle that we're any nicer to yeah. each other, because no. we're really not. Like, I mean, it's not just because of the dispatch boxes and the sword lens. You know, yeah. it's, it's, an, it's a nice cliche, but don't think that having an amphitheatre with no pillars in it makes you any nicer to each other. No, but you, but, but you win elections by exaggerating difference. And that is the nature of democratic politics. And I just wonder what you think the prospects are. And this is a yeah, question but, to all three of you of, 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 of finding this kind of... But, but kind this of, is where I worry about the current um, leadership within Number 10 and within the Conservative Party right now, is you win elections by doing more than just pointing out differences. You win elections by telling people that you are going to be able to deliver for them and let them raise their children in a way that's better than they had and give them more choices and speak to the touch points that are important to them, whether that's education or health or justice. You've... It's not just about saying, this other guy is a bad guy, vote for me. It's also about saying, you know, this is what you've told us you care about and this is what we can do for you. Just, so you've got to do both. Yeah. You can't just do one or the other. You can't just do hopey changey and you can't just do, you know, Corbyn's a disaster class. You actually have to have both. You've got to have both. Uh, before, I came, before I came on stage to do this session, I just Googled uh, Ruth Davidson, Boris Johnson. 
<laughs> Ruth Davidson slams Boris Johnson over Brexit over optimism. Ruth Davidson slams Boris Johnson over number 10 lockdown garden party. Ruth Davidson slates Boris Johnson for mocking public in Partygate scandal. Ruth Davidson slam for Boris attacks as tensions erupt. Ruth Davidson blasts Boris over Partygate response. <laughs> And then, That's kind of my favourite, because of its awfulness, the Scotsman, emotional Ruth Davidson slams Boris Johnson. I kind of wonder how many blokes would have had the adjective emotional, you know, Fred Splinge. Yeah, do you know, ordinarily I would have thrown a hissy fit about that, because you can only call women throwing hissy fits hissy fits. Um, <laughs> but, but, but actually I was, it was the, the end of a, an interview um, with Channel 4 News, and, and I found myself tearing up, and I'm, I'm not naturally, you know, a, a, a tearful emotive person and, and um, you know, like I say, I, I'm, I can be pretty robust in debate when and, and, and if I choose to be, but, but some of the things that I've been talking about and one of the reasons I've been out, so outspoken uh, on the party gate stuff is because I had constituents who weren't able to go to funerals. I had people that weren't able to hold dying people's hands. These are stuff you don't forget and it's, it's not about whether it was 10 minutes or 12 minutes. It's not about whether there was a call in the caterpillar cake or not. It was about what we asked people within the country to give up and what they chose to give up and how their guilt, they will always feel guilty for not being there for the loved people, uh, the people that they loved in their lives. And they weren't there because they thought they were doing the right thing by not being there. And somebody else was doing something else. So, so actually, I, I don't, I, you know, I'm, I'm not really an emotional person and I don't mind the headline saying that I got emotional on that one because I did, because the manifest unfairness of it and the amount of human tragedy that we've had in the last couple of years and the, the fact that everybody out there has such low resilience right now, we don't have time for our politicians to be crap. Could they just be good, please? Could we just have good politicians? I'm going to try a yes, no question. If he's leader at the next election, could you vote Conservative? Well, I'm in the House of Lords, so I don't get a vote at the next uh, election. See that. <laughs> <laughs> Should have seen that. Should have seen that coming. Yes, OK. Great answer. But if you did have a vote. Uh, <laughs> lost it now. Right. Um, the, the point about isn't it a fringe sport to seek consensus, to find a common ground? And do you think that there is a way of changing? And then I want to open it up to brief, brief answer, please, from each of you. Brief answer. I mean, yes, it's, it's a fringe sport because our system is designed to make it so. Uh, party activism, internal party democracy, it pushes the incentives in the wrong direction. And we have been talking all day about these big long-term problems that need big, huge consensus-based plays, right? on how you regulate and manage technology, on what the hell you do about climate change and how you get people to change their behavior quickly. And Ruth is right, we do not have time for our politicians to be crap, but they are. And, and, and so the question for me, like actually, how do you, how do you get, get the decisions outside of the dysfunctional system? At the moment, something like social care, for example, yep. super quickly, you know, every time there's a general election, it's easier to accuse the, the opposition of having a, a, a policy that's going to ruin people's lives and cost them money than to fix the problem. Okay. And, me, and all, of our, all of the problems we've been talking about today will fall into that unless you take them outside of the partisan system and put them in the hands of okay. actual human beings. I, I think we should just go back to the foundational uh, 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 aspects that lead to consensus. The first is that consensus is not a replacement for leadership. Consensus happens when you have great leadership, and I think the great example of that is, is Tony Blair and the Good Friday Agreement that brought together a disparate set of people from a very, very different uh, perspective and delivered peace, obviously alongside leadership from the United States and great leadership within, within Northern Ireland as well. So leadership is not a replacement, it can actually... And John Major consensus. starting it. <laughs> the, 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 the second thing is, I think we should talk more about values than just policies. Social care obviously is, is a policy that, that demands and requires consensus but if you go back to, to values I think you can actually identify the people who can co who, who agree with uh, consensus so for example respect for the rule of law uh, and equality under it uh, respect for human rights uh, respect for the uh, the principle that government honors its commitments both domestic uh, and abroad now just just establishing those values of democratic values that, that should bring together people from all parties actually sounds like a criticism of Boris Johnson right now, and that shows just how difficult 
our politics has got uh, across the board. But actually starting with values actually will lead to the policies that okay. can stem from it, not start with the policies and then lead back to the values underneath. We've got five minutes left. I want a couple of quick questions and I'm going to go right over there because I realise I ignore... Is anyone over there want to ask a question, by the way? No? OK, I'll stay in the same... <laughs> yes, there's a hand up there I can see in the... There you are. That's better. Sorry, let's start again. Um, the, the conversation has it's been about been adversarial yes, politics. Adversarial Go. politics, yes. There's been no discussion about a bigger problem, which I see, which is that lying in politics has no consequences anymore. And I wondered if the panel had any thoughts on how we could change that. OK, and uh, we'll take a question from the woman there at the end of the row. Uh, thank you. And I suspect we will, by the time we get answers to these two questions, we'll be done. Go on. Jennifer Nadel from Compassion in Politics. We actually presented a bill in Parliament. No speeches, would... just ask a question. OK. <laughs> How many of you on the platform would support um, a law against deliberate misrepresentation in politics? Our polling shows that 71% um, of Conservative okay. voters and 79% right. of Labour voters Good advertising. Voters Thank supported. you. <laughs> yes, right. So the question of what should be the punishment for... Uh, lying in politics. I mean, I suspect the answer is that you were never meant to be able to lie in politics. But Yeah, and it, and it should have profound um, effects, and, and that should be that, you know, you're, you're no longer holding a position on the platform of, of power. Um, whether that you believe that that requires primary legislation, I, I don't think it does. And I think part of the reason for that is there are contested truths. Now, we don't like that. We like the idea that everything has just one answer. Um, but, but there are contested truths. Uh, and we have to be grown up about that. T to answer the, the question that, that these two guys were asked about how t you get people involved, and I, I wasn't brought in on that, very quickly, we've had attempts and nibbles at the edges to do stuff. So we've had open primaries where it's not just about the CLP or the, 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 the Tory party like membership voting uh, for, for candidates, and, and they've been discarded. Um, we've had attempts at having citizens' assemblies uh, in this country. I, th I think if you look at, at Scotland, it was launched on the same day as the other half of it, which was putting another referendum bill against half of people, and it was seen as a vehicle for that. But, but they work in Ireland, for example. Uh, if you look at, at different... It's not just about people working together, um, and, and politicians actually do. We do that in committees all the time. We do it when uh, trying to get private members' bills being adopted by government of any shade, we, we do do it, but it's also about how do you create space for that to happen, how do you create space for what you're saying, which is getting more people involved in that, and, and at a UK level, something like a citizens' assembly, there is a climate change one, you can do it for individual ideas, and, and that's maybe something we should look more at. Just, just, just on the, on, I want to bring it back to the audience questions, which is about honesty in politics, do you think that we are, I mean, I, look, I covered the Trump presidency, and where on day one, it was clear that I was going to have to say on the news, and I fought very hard that I should be able to say it, that is not true, that's a lie. Um, do you think that we are in a qualitatively, quantitatively different place now in politics? Politicians have always tried to fashion truth in, to shape their policies or whatever, that, to shape what decisions they've done. But do you think what we've seen here in the UK and in the US puts us in a different place? I, I do. Uh, look, we, we've seen our democratic institutions being challenged and stressed both in America and here in a way that it hasn't ever done so before. We do need to. I think there's going to be a big drive in the future, I hope, post the era we're in now and the, the, the administration we have now, where we're going to have to really think about how uh, a system with an unwritten constitution can hold the executive to account because at the moment our entire system rests on the decency of the person who is at the top and as prime minister. We're going to have to rethink that in terms of the independence and the full independence of the media in order to scrutinise the civil service, the judiciary, parliament itself, all of these things. But just on the point about uh, MPs telling the truth, I think the, the key thing is, is, is ways in which the people who elect MPs can hold them to account. And I think, personally, I've said this a few times now, the oath of office, when you get sworn in, is simply an oath of allegiance to the Queen. Important, but I think we should add on that, that you will tell the truth. At least you can be held to account for it. We need to rethink the oath that MPs take into account. 
on the thing about heat, this is the, the thing about this is uh, I've been an MP for six, seven years, and I have hun had hundreds of messages saying I wish you'd all grow up when uh, at PMQs and stop acting like children. Can I have tickets, please? <laughs> I have never once in seven years had somebody write to me and say, can I go to an education debate? You know, so it, it, people are complex on these sorts of issues. We need to make sure that the thing that people engage with uh, politics, we don't lose uh, the, the rawness of it at times, but we do have to provide space and reward consensus where it exists. The fascinating thing to me, given that you can get those polling results, everyone's, politicians shouldn't lie, and yet they're not punished. What Donald Trump discovered and we've replicated in the UK is you can kind of lie and get away with it. And why do the voters think that way? I think it's because people are profoundly alienated from the idea that politicians can actually improve their lives or that policy matters. But it's because they're not involved. Westminster is distant and far away. And when democracy is once a year or probably once every four or five, there's no feedback loop. There's no, I did this, that happened, oh, maybe I should do something different. There's no way of learning, of building up a democratic skill set. Democracy is about how we make decisions collectively, and we don't learn about it because all of the decisions are taken away from us through a system that we cannot comprehend. Democracy needs to be every day. It needs to be part of how society is run in every community and in every region and city. And if you change democracy in that way, if you reconnect it to people's lives, the feedback loop that enables people to recognize that politicians who lie make their life worse rather than just make TV more interesting can actually kick in and you could actually have a democracy that works. Well, thank you, the three of you, for being on this panel and for sharing. There are some panel discussions you just feel, I would like to keep this going for about another hour. <laughs> this has absolutely been one of them. Thank you so much uh, for your participation. Thank you.